my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this episode of CAFC Presents. The title of today's webinar is Parental Presence During Induction of Anesthesia, Finding Common Ground. And we are pleased to, uh, to, to welcome to the CAFC uh, audience once again the, the Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition. And I'm going to be handing the virtual podium over to uh, the, the CCYHC's or the coalition's co-chair, Dr. Sarah Jones, in just a minute. But first off, I just want everyone to be aware that we are recording the presentation uh, and we do make all of the documents, PowerPoint slides, anything that the presenters make available to us, we will be posting on the Knowledge Exchange Network that you can see on the screen um, in front of you. Uh, and we also record the, uh, we also post the full audio visual recording up there as well. We do allow uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, we require you to type in your questions. You should see the little question box in the control panel that usually appears on the right-hand side of your screen. I always encourage people to, to type the questions in as you think of them. That way we know which presenter they may be directed at. Uh, but again, if you think of something later on in the presentation that is relevant to one of the earlier presenters, by all means, please type it in then and we'll be sure that the appropriate person gives you a response. And we do always encourage our panelists to uh, sort of have a little bit of back and forth on the questions as well if they have if they have input. Uh, so I think that being said, I think uh, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Sarah Jones, uh, the co-chair of the Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition and a pediatric surgeon at the Children's Hospital at the London Health Sciences Centre, London, Ontario. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, I think first the coalition would like to thank uh, CAFC for allowing us to uh, be involved uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, parental presence and induction, finding a common ground. Um, I think this webinar is about uh, teaching us, uh, informing us that it doesn't always work the same way for everybody and that um, you know one shoe doesn't fit all um, and that finding a common ground and a common message uh, I think is very important to the, um, to the, the meat and potatoes of this webinar. Um, we have a number of, uh, well, they're all uh, fantastic presenters today. Um, just a very brief introduction to everybody, um, and thank you for attending the webinar. So first uh, um, up today is going to be Frank Gavin. Um, he's a parent who's worked um, as a volunteer to advance child and youth and family-centered care for a very number of years. Uh, Frank, and I won't uh, indulge upon those years. Um, and I think uh, he's uh, really um, fostered the advancement of um, the uh, Canadian Family Advisory Network, CFAN. And he was certainly integral um, to starting uh, um, the uh, parental presence at induction uh, thought process uh, with the coalition. Um, then we'll be turning to Je Dr. James Wright, who's a professor in the Department of Surgery, University of Toronto. He's Chief of Perioper Perioperative Services at Hospital for Sick Children. He's Chief of the Department of Surgery there, and he's also an orthopedic surgeon. So I think he has a very um, personal and uh, um, in-depth uh, um, thought about uh, this uh, experience. Um, then we're going to uh, ask the, the CHEO crowd, I would uh, call them, um, to give us their experience. Um, we have Dr. Leslie Hall, who's a staff anesthetist and uh, is apparently an advocate for parental presence um, at induction and a family-focused approach to uh, provision of perioperative uh, care. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Terry Pridham and Lorraine McInnes, who, um, when I added up their years of perioperative nursing experience, I can only say it was quite extensive. Uh, so I think we should leave it at that, but to say they have a lot of uh, experience to offer. And then we're going to be moving along to uh, Alexander Kostopovic, who is uh, um, uh, a, a registered early childhood educator, and she has developed and implemented the Child Life Program uh, and PPI at the Humber River Hospital. Um, she did that in 1998 and still continues to do that. And then at the end of the session today, we're going to um, uh, finish up with Frank and hopefully uh, lots of discussion. Um, and uh, as uh, Doug mentioned, uh, you're very much invited to uh, type in your questions and we will um, attempt to answer them from the panel. So I think without further ado, uh, we will move on uh, to Frank. And uh, I will allow him to uh, to tell us why we're here. Frank, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, my, my this part of the the presentation will really present an overview of uh, the the process that we looked at 
uh, in developing a report uh, on parental presence at induction. We also included recovery, but the focus will be on induction. So we'll talk, I'll talk briefly about the process itself and then give a very high level overview of the, what we heard from parents, from youth, a little bit of what we learned in the literature review, and then uh, we'll move uh, into the next presenter. So essentially the, the project actually began in 2008 uh, when the coalition, um, which is a, 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 an organization that includes many, many uh, professional groups, um, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, uh, Canadian Pediatric Society, etc. But there's a, it's a wide coalition of people involved in child and youth health, asked the family advisory, the Canadian Family Advisory Network, um, to lead a project called the, the Child and Family in the Healthcare System. Because the perception was that although uh, family-centered care had advanced quite a lot in recent decades, there were some inconsistencies, still some areas where you know, there was more contention uh, than is certainly desired. Um, and so they asked us essentially to decide what area we wish to focus upon, what area this project should focus upon. And at a, our annual meeting in 2008 in Edmonton, the families decided overwhelmingly to focus on the twin issues of parental presence at induction uh, and recovery. Uh, and although we'll, again, focus on induction, it should be noted that the area of recovery was of just about equal importance to those parents. Uh, and the idea was that parents had experienced a lot of, there was a lot of variation. Parents talked to one another. And they discovered that essentially what seems to happen at one hospital doesn't happen at another hospital. And it was also clear that within the same hospital, there was a, certainly a perception that things, uh, there was an unpredictability. They would perceive it as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an inconsistency. There was also a perception that the issue was a fairly easy one, a fairly simple one. Um, and when we talked to physicians, um, it was clear that it wasn't nearly as simple. Um, it wasn't uncomplicated at all. And I think it could be described as kind of two solitudes. Um, interestingly, many of the parents who had, had had some difficulty, you know, with induction, being ac getting access, having surprised denial of access to, to uh, in the presence at induction, um, had no idea, like, why. Uh, this had why they hadn't been able to be present and uh, when I talked to physician they all said well the evidence shows that it in many cases doesn't work but but there were sort of two solitudes and part of this whole process pro project was to try to bring to reduce to end the solitudes and to bring the different voices together um, so we established a working group they were a mix of uh, parents and healthcare professionals nurses child life specialists etc there weren't any doctors in the working group but I must say that um, initially dr. Jeff Blair from BC Children's and later dr. Sarah Jones were very helpful in uh, in providing us with some feedback and some guidance uh, and some direction as well so we developed surveys of parents uh, and youth hospitals we do, we pilot them uh, we distributed them we analyzed them we did a fairly extensive literature search. Um, we uh, drafted a report. We redrafted the report. We drafted it again. And finally, in 2013, uh, the, the steering committee, the coalition, endorsed the recommendations of the report. Now, that report is available to everyone at this link. Um, uh, and uh, this again, this presentation will be archived. So every, anyone who wants to follow the, the report, look at the report in more detail, is certainly welcome to. Um, in terms of the parents, uh, we used our, the Canadian Family Advisory Network is a um, is a network of of mostly advisory councils at the various uh, pediatric health centers, rehabilitation centers across Canada. Uh, and what we did was we sent out we through these councils a survey of the parents. We got 121 resp responses from parents, very detailed responses. Um, all the all of the responders were parents of children who had had recent surgery. That is, in the last you know half dozen years or so, a third of the parents had had a child uh, have surgery in the in the past year alone. Forty six percent had it had a child with four or more surgeries. So that last statistic alone tells you that they're not entirely the most they're not entirely typical. Um, you know, and as in, because many of them are members of advisory councils, they're not all that typical in that respect as well. 
um, obviously by just simply those who respond to surveys aren't necessarily the most typical. But it should be said that their, that their survey responses pretty much align with all the other data we've seen in the literature from pilot projects at other hospitals and so forth uh, about uh, what their uh, experiences have been and what their desires are. Uh, essentially, um, you know, as you can see here, the overwhelming majority of parents uh, think it's important or very important to be present at induction uh, and recovery. Um, uh, and it should be noted, however, that it's not 100%, and I think that's, uh, you know, something to be kept in mind, uh, that, you know, again, the overwhelming majority, but not everyone. Um, the interesting point was, if you remember, you know, how experienced a group this is, a third said they had never been present at induction, and over a quarter said they had never been present in recovery, which was, we thought, quite a high number. And given the importance of preparation, nearly half said they had not been required to do any kind of preparation uh, program whatsoever, um, you know, coming to the hospital or, or go reviewing certain materials, etc. cetera. Um, essentially, the, what, what the results of the parents said, and again, this is very high level, um, they very much believe that their, that their presence uh, calms, comforts their child. The, a number of them made a point about they thought it made it safer because they brought some information to the process that came up and they wanted to share with the, with, with the surgical team and very much makes them feel part of the team in the same way that their experience in other parts of the hospital, you know, they feel that they are, they are included in the, in, the, in the care team. Unfortunately, many and these are terms that came up repeatedly, sort of having to struggle, plead, or fight hard to be present, uh, to make their case, uh, uh, to be present at either induction or recovery. Um, again, what came out was that, especially with, with induction, um, the reasons why they weren't able to be present were often not clear to them. In terms of recovery, that wasn't so much the case. The two things that were often said were, the nurses are too busy or it's too crowded in there. Uh, but then again, this often came up at the, at the last minute. Uh, on the other hand, there were reports of wonderful experiences of collaboration with nurses, uh, with child life specialists. Uh, and with anesthetists, you know, people who had felt wonderfully supported, well informed, uh, you know, there were a number of very positive experiences as well. Uh, and this is important, I think. Um, most uh, in their accounts describe their experience within a, within a wider time frame, the time leading up to the surgical experience, and in particular, the days, weeks, and months following uh, discharge. You know, that you know what the effect was on on their own uh, experience of it, their own memories of it, their own children's behavior. Uh, I have included a number of quotations from parents. I won't uh, touch them here. I'm simply going to draw people's attention that they are uh, among the, they, they certainly um, um, informed our experience. Reading through them was very powerful. Um, so I'm just going to go through it. Just note, every, draw your attention to the fact that they will be available here and there are more quotations available on the actual document itself. Now, in terms of the survey of, of youth, um, we surveyed youth essentially from two councils, one in Toronto and one in London, Ontario. Um, nearly all of those youth we surveyed were teenagers. Um, as you can see, um, almost half had had a parent present during induction. And these, again, were very ex people, uh, youth who had had, in most cases, several uh, experiences of, uh, 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 several experiences of surgery. Um, most thought by far that it would have been important or very important to have a parent present. Um, um, and only a, only a handful, really, six reported being asked by hospital what their own opinion was about this. And most said that they would like to have been consulted. Uh, they didn't frame it as we wanted you know, to be able to say yes or no, but most really did wish they had been talked to about this. Um, so, um, this is um, the two comments from youth, which I'll just let you read for a second. They're sort of typical, and they show a certain kind of wisdom, uh, and they certainly uh, show a, a, uh, an awareness of the difference of their own developmental stages, and that what would have made, would have been perhaps uh, particularly useful young earlier on, may not be the same now that they are teenagers. 
In terms of the survey of hospitals, um, we sent them to 32 hospitals across the country. We got responses from 16, which I think is a pretty good number. Uh, there are quite a variety of hospitals, many teaching hospitals, but also many community hospitals, and they're from across the country. Um, for our American guests, seven provinces is actually most of the provinces of Canada, so it wasn't a regional response whatsoever. Uh, in terms of providing parental presence at induction, as you can see, uh, again, uh, the practices really do vary. I mean, one said always, most said usually or occasionally, um, and two said never. In terms of providing parental recovery, parental presence and recovery, you can see the numbers there. What's interesting is that uh, six, nearly half, said they always do, which is a little bit in conflict with the data we got from the parents. So, um, you know, I'm, 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 maybe, maybe that always has some exceptions there. I'm not sure, but again, a variety of responses. Uh, in terms of the main reasons for the hospitals providing it, you can see this, that many thought it would have decreased patient or family anxiety. They want to become more family-centered and they also wanted to increase uh, patient and family satisfaction. Uh, two and three not being exactly the same. In terms of not providing it, um, there was a case of some saying that there's no research. Some hospitals said they weren't aware of any research that supported it. Um, the um, so, and so, some indicated that there was uh, opposition from uh, staff, especially anesthetists. Uh, in some cases, not all anesthetists. Maybe some of the anesthetists on staff, but uh, it, but there was certainly. Uh, identified opposition from some of the people in the departments of, of anesthesia, and some thought that some families simply were not um, were not ready for it, were not appropriate for uh, uh, for presence. In terms of the literature, um, what we had, what we found was that you know, uh, and this was a revelation. I think most parents, <clears throat> only two or three of the 121, indicated that anyone had indicated to them that parental presence does not always have the desired effect. So there was a huge communication problem. So we thought, so obviously parental presence by itself, um, you know, apart from any kind of preparation program, et cetera, is sometimes has, is ineffective or sometimes has an opposite effect, sometimes. Uh, there's evidence that some children um, uh, benefited um, more or more are more likely to benefit. Um, and there's a, a reference here, children who are older, have lower levels of anxiety in their temperament, and who have parents who are calmer and who value preparation and coping skills. Uh, so that tells you that there are some parents who are more likely. Anecdotally, there was a lot of evidence that children with developmental disabilities uh, are uh, 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 more likely to benefit or uh, from a parental presence and induction. And I noted that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia just inaugurated a presence where they a program where they have service dogs as well as a parent present for children who are have developmental disabilities, and apparently it's been very successful. Uh, and finally, the last slide here, the main findings, preparation is absolutely crucial. And parents talked about this, knowing that how the child could become heavy, what will happen with the child's eyes, etc. Um, Family-centered care, in some cases, you know, there's a program, there was a, an, an article, again, referenced in the in report, uh, can produce, um, in, in, in cases, less need for analgesia, less delirium, and quicker discharges. And there's an interesting uh, um, paper written out of uh, children, Alberta Children's Hospital that showed that um, parental presence in recovery has real benefit on children's behavior a couple of weeks after discharge. So um, that's a very high-level overview of what we found in our, uh, in our report. And I'll, uh, at the very end, I'll come back with some uh, information about the conclusions and recommendations that we made. So over to you, Doug. Thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, there haven't been any questions, so uh, unless there's any other comments from the panel, I think we can just go right on to our next preventer, presenter, uh, which is Dr. James Wright. Um, so I have a few slides, and are they in view? Um, uh, they, are, they, are, they are now, yep. Great, and I'll just close this panel. Great, so my task was to talk about the surgeon's view, um, to discuss a little bit about the preparation uh, that goes on prior to uh, surgery, and uh, specifically as it relates to uh, parental uh, presence. So... You may, yeah, 
There, there you go. Now your slide. There we go. Yeah. So um, just to begin and to emphasize some of the things that Frank's already said, at least among surgeons, uh, there is a range of views um, within institutions and between surgeons. Uh, I think um, some uh, see this as easy to do, believing that it makes sense that having a parent uh, present uh, during induction uh, would make sense. And um, as Frank indicated, uh, it's a little more complicated uh, in terms of the presence um, and uh, as my subsequent comments uh, will um, um, again uh, embellish what Frank said, it's much more complicated. So some surgeons think it's easy to do um, and others um, are not uh, fully conversant with the literature which prompted us to do a literature review that in some cases um, not only is it not helpful but there is a small possibility of, of uh, increasing harm. So um, the uh, opposite view would be that uh, some surgeons are not necessarily supportive um, out of the perception that the uh, logistics of um, uh, getting the uh, patient ready to come into the room and um, and their presence of the room slows down the operative process um, and uh, that that interferes with efficiency and um, I would say that there's widespread uncertainty uh, uh, about what the process should uh, should be uh, ideally. Um, within my hospital um, I've worked here on staff for 23 years. Uh, at SickKids, uh, 23 years ago, I would say parental presence uh, was very infrequent. It, it's become more uh, common at our hospital, uh, but I would uh, say that I understand other hospitals, it's more of the default. And in our hospital, it still remains uh, a bit of a more active process uh, rather than the, the default expectation. So in terms of what happens prior to surgery, setting the expectations for the family uh, for all aspects of their operative procedure, um, including parental presence, one of the uh, issues is that there are many people in many stages in that. Uh, so often the surgeon would see the uh, child usually in a hospital-based clinic, uh, so they begin to have the discussion about surgery, what's involved. Uh, many clinics would have nursing staff which would be involved in the education of families and uh, educating them about what to expect. Uh, many surgeons' offices would have office staff uh, who are, are doing the scheduling, but in some cases supporting um, the families. Uh, at our hospital, the family physicians are still expected to, to perform a preoperative physical, so they may uh, interject some of um, their um, experiences or understandings. Uh, we have a pre-anesthetic clinic. Uh, approximately 50% or 60% of children are um, seen in some context, but it's a variable. In some cases, it uh, is a screening phone call. In other cases, it's a visit uh, seeing an RN uh, or an advanced practice nurse and uh, even the uh, anesthetist. Some hospitals and some divisions and departments and some hospitals have a reminder phone call just prior to the surgery to deal with last minute uh, information. And then finally there's the parental information uh, which may be printed or, or it may be website. So all of this is a mixture together, uh, getting the family ready and on the parental presence, um, they sometimes get uh, different information, conflicting information. In terms of um, one of the th key things that we continue to struggle with and work on is the communication of critical information. So it's a question of who collects that information, how it's transmitted, and how it affects the surgical planning. So uh, the surgeon may uh, collect some information on the parent, which may or may not be germane to what the anesthetist collects, and that back and forth leading to a minimal changes in the surgical scheduling and a consistent message to, to, the, uh, to the family is uh, is something we we struggle with and of course this candidacy for parental presence um, are they allowed are they not allowed and and when is that decision made in terms of the day of um, this all culminates in uh, patients uh, children youths and families who come um, uh, prepared for an experience and then how are they actually managed uh, the day of um, at least in our uh, hospital um, uh, while the parents, uh, certainly uh, some of them, particularly the more experienced parents, do express uh, their wishes. Uh, the anesthesia clinic preoperatively begins to engage the family uh, ideally uh, in that discussion. But at least our hospital, um, the anesthetist of the day makes the final decision. So it's a question of who makes uh, the decision and then uh, for everyone involved is how is the decision uh, reached? Uh, what are the criteria and why would it be appropriate or not appropriate uh, in certain uh, circumstances. And uh, with Frank's health, we've come a, a long way at our hospital, but I still believe we haven't educated everyone and communicated as well as possible.
Then finally, there's the entrance into the room. Um, some parents uh, or practitioners uh, will be familiar with the surgical safety checklist. This has been an evolving um, expectation. It's a very positive thing in terms of uh, enhancing the communication the day of uh, surgery. At our hospital, we have four stages to the checklist, so the morning of, uh, at 7.35, the entire team assembles and talks about all cases of the day so we can plan out the day. Um, the next stage is uh, when, the parent, uh, when the child comes into the room, and we call that the uh, briefing. Uh, so that's to review the salient features. Um, and um, we have a, a bit of a, a potential um, logistical difficulty. Uh, on one hand, we want to get the uh, child to sleep, and sometimes having the parent there um, potentially um, slows that process down. Uh, we're always concerned that the child is minimally disturbed with the preparations prior to surgery. On the other hand, uh, many of our uh, children, either through age or uh, cognitive development, aren't really able to participate in uh, the description of what the procedure is going to be and what their uh, past medical history, and the parents have a huge role to play there. So uh, on one hand, uh, this issue of efficiency comes up. On the other hand, having them present not only is it important in terms of potentially uh, alleviating uh, anxiety, but it's also very important in the safety checklist. So. Um, that's uh, something that we're um, uh, interested in, in and uh, see as a benefit of the parent being there. So in conclusion, uh, I believe that early, uh, complete and relevant sharing of patient information before surgery is the key, um, not just in terms of preparation for the surgery, but it also uh, often is germane to the question of whether the parent could be present. Uh, we've worked very hard to develop an institutional policy with uh, clear criteria. Uh, we continue to work on that. Uh, we do struggle a little bit with uh, anesthetists having individual opi opinions or surgeons having individual opinions which may be divergent from the um, agreed upon criteria and um, I says it needs to be wisely understood that's uh, it should be widely it doesn't uh, but wisely and widely uh, understood and then communicate as Frank said communication to the families about institutional policies and understanding the processes leading up to and including coming to the OR uh, I think are very helpful in coming out of this webinar. I hope we'll see a little more consistency uh, across the country. Those are my comments. All right, thank you, Dr. Wright. That was ex that was excellent. Uh, this is just my chance to remind the audience: if you do have any questions, please uh, type them into the box so that we can uh, you know make sure we have a nice list of questions to go get to at the discussion at the end. Uh, so I think at this point we're going to be moving uh, from Toronto to Ottawa to our colleagues at CHEO with uh, Dr. Uh, Leslie Hall, uh, the anesthesiologist at CHEO, and Lorraine McInnes and Terry Pridham, the two uh, uh, nurses from the operating and recovery rooms at CHEO. So we're just going to hand over to, uh, uh, to them. So uh, Dr. Um, Leslie and Terry, I think uh, uh, Dr. Hall is going to try to present her slides from her own computer. We're going to try this real quick. So Dr. Hall, you should see a little box pop up on your screen, and once you click that Show My Screen button, we should it be able to, be to see. It should be on screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you just fine, and we can okay, see your screen good. now. So just uh, uh, Lorraine, I think they wanted, Doug wanted me to try my show. Okay. Um, so I'm just sorry, guys. I'm just a, a, a it looks good. computer genius. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So um, anyway, uh, thank you very much for this invitation uh, and this opportunity to talk. Uh, I'm one of the anesthesiologists at CHEO. I've been there since 1984. I've done parental presence at induction even before we had a program in selected cases and then I was part of the initial discussion to to get when we the initial meetings that we had to develop our PPI program in the in the 90s now I will have to figure out how I move my slides forward hit the enter button got it okay so I'm just going to cover a little bit about sort of my background and our background in anesthesia about this so um, uh, Frank certainly alluded to this at the beginning, you know, that uh, anxiety um, and, and prior to surgery is prevalent in children, up to 50 to 75 percent of them uh, develop significant fear and anxiety. Up to a quarter of them are extremely anxious and require physical restraint when they come into the operating room. And probably most important, anesthetic induction has been shown to be the most strength, stressful event of the entire perioperative period. So that's a big concern for us as anesthesiologists. 
Preoperative anxiety is known to be an independent predictor of developing negative postoperative behaviors. Children displaying elevated anxiety and preoperatively are three and a half times more likely to develop negative postoperative behaviors when compared to a lower anxiety cohort. It matters what we do. It, we, we can have a significant effect on children. Um, many of these uh, new maladaptive behaviors are seen two weeks after surgery, but some of them can persist for up to six months in a significant percentage of children, and in a smaller percentage of children, some of them can persist even longer. So it's a problem, and it needs to be addressed. I'm fond of this slide. I, I did a, an anesthesia fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia just prior to coming to Ottawa, and Michael Brandy was kind of one of my heroes there. And this was one of Mike's comments that, thusly, you can put a child to sleep any way you want once. And I've always kept that in mind, and that's kind of been one of my guiding principles of how I manage kids. So since anxiety and, and fear are very common things, what can we do to make things better? Well, there are, there's no one system that works, and it's probably a combination of things. We've tried behavioral interventions, we've tried pharmacological interventions, and we've recently introduced parental presence and induction in our institution. Um, let me just go back. So behavioral preparation, um, there have been numerous studies done. Kane et al. is probably one of the big names in, 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 uh, in uh, preoperative anxiety and the things that we can do to make it better. And he compared something like a common thing we do, which is like an OR tour versus a modeling videotape versus child life specialist teaching coping skills. And he found that child life preparation was the most effective for holding area and separation anxiety, but no intervention was effective for alleviating anxiety at the induction of anesthesia. So we haven't made that part of the process any better. We know that studies that have been done on children undergoing painful medical procedures show that, reveal that there are coping promoting and sort of distress promoting behaviors that can, can improve or make things worse. And it's possible to teach physicians, nurses, trainees, and parents to practice coping pro promoting behaviors which help the child. So coping promoting behaviors such as, for example, distraction where we talk about something like the child's toy or something like their favorite movie, try to stay away, stay with non-procedure related talk, use humor, use developmentally appropriate procedural in information. These are all things that help. Um, medical reinterpretation, which is basically reframing a medical procedure as a positive thing. So for example, saying to a child, how would you, you know, here's your astronaut mask that you can breathe through. Giving children appropriate control, not, not control that's not really control. So letting them choose, for example, the flavor that they're going to have in their mask. These are things that work in the operating room. Surprisingly, distress promoting behaviors often consist of the things that we actually think should should help the child, like reassuring comments like, oh, it's okay and don't worry, or being critical, you know, toughen up, and or apologizing to the child, or being very empathic. <laughs> These things actually don't seem to work, and they don't seem to work because they seem to allow the child to focus on the event that's stressing them and, you know, keep them focused on their distress. So a bit of a surprise, but definitely shown to work. So the last, the other big thing that we, we look at in, in our practice is the use of medication to help children who are anxious. And there are many objectives to pre-medication the, from the anesthetic perspective, but the ones that we're focusing on here are drugs that help us allay anxiety, drugs that produce amnesia, and drugs that facilitate anesthetic induction. So those are the things we're focusing on. I can tell you right now that producing amnesia can be a two-edged sword. And the reason it can be a problem is that it's been shown that if a child has had a very traumatic anesthetic induction and that and the next thing they come to the hospital and the family relates this then we say well we're going to give this kid a good pre-med this time so we get a good pre-med in and the kid is very has a great experience but when the kid comes back to the hospital he doesn't remember that great experience because our drugs are effectively amnestic and the next time he comes back to the hospital what he remembers is the first bad experience so, you know, it makes a difference about, you've got, to you've got to make these decisions early on in the kid's experience in the hospital. So sedation is the most common and, in fact, the most effective method for reducing preoperative anxiety. Having said that, this does not negate the role of parents. So 
I talked to, at uh, Family Forum at SHIO. I was asked to talk to them when we were initially um, dealing with this issue of uh, parental presence at induction, and, and there had been some, at that time, not great interactions with the medical service system and, these, and the parents with respect to this topic. So anyway, I was a lucky person who got elected to do this. So when I spoke to them, I said, you know, I, I think there's three reasons that parents give to be present at the induction of, of anesthesia. One is they, they want to be able to calm their child down, they want to be able to protect their child, and they want to be able to support their child through these stressful and dis difficult things that the child has to experience in their life, anesthetic induction being one of them. Now, the ability of parents to calm the child is pretty variable. Um, you know what, in my opinion, the anxiety that children experience prior to anesthesia is appropriate anxiety. And so there's probably a good reason that they have this appropriate anxiety. It's probably something evolutionary that's protective to have anxiety about strange people invading your personal space and being in strange environments. And so it's not surprising to me that it's not always possible for parents to relieve anxiety. Um, we sometimes observe that kids' behavior gets worse with their parents present and, you know, does that mean that, that the child is acting out or is it just basically, or he's more stressed or is it basically that in the presence of the parent, the child feels more able to openly express their feelings? And I'm always very careful and concerned about a quiet child who's in the operating room without their parents because I sometimes feel that they may be equally or even more anxious in what they're doing. Their coping mechanism is they're just zoning out. They're just pulling themselves out of the experience, withdrawing from the experience. And it doesn't mean that they're, that they're happy or non-stressed. So I've always felt that anxiety reduction may not be the most useful endpoint when we're looking at the role of parents in the operating room. The other problem that can come up is that, especially if we get things in the media about anesthesia problems, uh, we often get this huge, we, at, before we had our PPI program, we had this huge increase in requests for parents to come into the operating room. If parents have had very negative experiences with the medical system, they're often not very trustful. And face it, it's not very easy to hand control over to somebody you've just met and let give them their your child to look after. But trust problems and parental presence can be very volatile mix. And it's very, very important that you get to the bottom of this before you bring a child into the OR environment. And in fact, in some extreme cases, it may be better to either just delay the procedure or just forgo the PPI. Now, um, I think the main reason that parents come into the operating room, really what parents are there to do is to, is to be present with, for their child, for things that the child has to go through in their life that the parents can't prevent or change or avoid. And you know, as a parent, it's, it's easy to provide support when it makes a difference. The hardest thing to do is to stand there and be present when there's nothing you can do as a parent to make things better for your child. That's really a tough time to be a parent, but that's the times that count for the kids. And parents say emphatically, I don't care if I if I can't make this thing better, I want to be there. I want to let my child know I'm not walking out on them. And I think the problem with these kind of measuring these kind of effects is that these kind of parenting strategies, these parenting things we do, we don't get to see how well they work until years and years after. You know, maybe if we're lucky when our kids are grown up, they tell us what a great job we did. But I don't think we really get to tell. The other thing about PPI is that it's really an anesthesia decision. What happens in the operating room when you bring a patient into the room is a, is a dialogue that's going on at a verbal and a nonverbal level. When you bring a parent in, they're part of that dialogue. No matter what they think, you know, I won't be a problem, I'm just here, I'm just standing here, they're always part of what's going on. And sometimes patient safety and well-being depends on us keeping that dialogue limited to just the patient and the staff. And so there are situations where we, we in our institution, we don't allow parents to come into the operating room. Okay, so how do we make PPI work? Well, first of all, we've got to have realistic expectations of what we're going to accomplish in the OR. We've got to assess parental anxiety carefully. There's got to be a strong education component. We need to pick age and developmentally appropriate strategies. We need to look at non-pharmacologic strategies, pharmacologic adjuncts, and combination therapies. I'm, I'm a huge promoter of 
having a child have a pre-med and have their parents present. Why don't we make the whole thing a win-win situation for everybody? So what works? Um, parental preparation, very clear instructions to the parents where to stand, and what to do, because the more delay and fumbling in the operating room, the more anxious the kid gets. Um, I tell my trainees, don't get hung up on a specific induction technique. Sometimes you got to switch. You think the one way is going to go, it may not. Uh, recognize delay tactics. Um, you know, sometimes kids just don't want to be there. They just don't. It doesn't matter what you say. The younger the child, the less the buy into the procedure. So sometimes the drugs that we use for sedation can really help the child accept what is basically an invasion of their personal space. It just makes it easier for them to tolerate the things that we're doing, such as putting a mask on their face. The other thing that's important that I tell parents is, you know, your kid may come into the OR and connect with somebody else. You know, it could be the nurse, it could be a child life worker, it could be a resident, it could be the surgeon. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean your presence isn't helpful and it doesn't mean we need to change anything. We just need to respect that and if that works for the kid, let's go with it. Anesthesiologists are good at what we do, but sometimes things can happen in the operating room during the induction. And if parents are moved out of the way or asked to leave, they need to comply. And you cannot get that to work unless you have personnel available to escort the parents out of the area and into the OR as well. And finally, and I think this is important for both parents and those of us who bring them in the operating room, it's not a test. A parent has not failed if their child cries or is upset during the induction. Thanks for letting me uh, make my comments. Dr. Hall, and I think we're going to now hear from your colleagues at CHEO, uh, um, Lorraine McInnes and Terry Pridham. Over, over to you guys. Um, yes, as an RN that has, uh, I'm Terry, and as an RN that's been in the um, OR and uh, recovery room, um, I can say that there have been challenges, benefits, and uh, we definitely have some lessons learned, so we're going to address that from an RN perspective. We've had PPI at CHEO since 2008-2009, uh, and we started out with a pilot project, and it's just evolved into a policy and procedure that we have um, developed. And so there, there have been a lot of challenges along the way. I think we have come a long way since the beginning. Um, but some of the challenges have been certainly parental um, presence on induction. When the parents come into the operating room, often they're very distracted. I think from the environment, they, they haven't had a lot of preparation. They don't know what to expect themselves. You get them into their room and, uh, and they're distracted. They're looking around. They're not even paying attention to their child. So they have to be prompted to uh, pay attention and distract their child. Um, sometimes we get parents that are distressed. Um, they cry. They become more anxious as they come as they come into the room, and uh, therefore, you know, the child becomes more anxious as well. Um, time constraints have been a big problem. Um, introducing PPI here, uh, it does take time to prepare the parent, the parents, and the child properly, and um, often we feel rushed to get the child into the room and get that surgery started. So that's been a problem. Um, and we still, I think, have to address that to a certain extent. Uh, manpower, we started out uh, at first, we have volunteers that take the parents and are responsible for them uh, and bring them out again. But sometimes we don't have volunteers, so it's up to the team. Usually the RN has to find somebody because we can't leave our patients. So that's been a bit of a problem um, over the years. Um, probably a really big problem, and I'm sure Dr. Hall would agree, is the buy-in from colleagues. It's been a long process to try and get everybody on board with PPI to see the benefits of it for the child and for the family. We are a child, uh, a family-centered care facility, and um, this has been this has been a big problem. For just some days, some days uh, we've had people that would agree and, and not agree. So that's been a problem as well, a challenge. Um, and as, as Dr. Hall mentioned, when parents don't want to leave the operating room when they're re requested to leave, uh, and this happens quite often, they delay and, and they wonder if their child's okay, so they have to be prompted and uh, quickly let out of the operating room. So that's been a challenge as well. Um, 
of course, the benefits have been happier children, happier parents and families. We don't know. We can look at the literature and we can see the long-term effects. Some studies have, have shown that even two weeks after or post-op, that this has been a benefit to the families, to the children, with less anxiety and better healing times and, and that kind of thing. So I think the benefits are obvious. And certainly um, that report was excellent. And I would say that I agree with everything that the parents put forth and, and what I've seen here at CHEO in my experience. It's, it's been the same. Okay, pass it on to Lorraine. Um, thanks. I'm going to be uh, just looking, we're um, pinch hitting here, uh, Terry and I, uh, looking at what going forward, how we're going to continue this. As Dr. Hall said, we have a full policy that has just been reviewed um, so that we can always fall back on, on the support of administration when surrounding a parental presence. And we are literally just now uh, reviewing and revising our handout, which is what I have up on the screen. And um, we've called it for the purpose of the, of the parents, parental presence in the operating room. Our policy is still at induction. Um, the sort of international term is parental presence at induction. But our concern was that maybe not every parent knows what induction itself means. But they do know what it means just to be present in the operating room. So our key is having the communication, very clear language, making sure everyone in the circle understands the process, certainly, most importantly, the parents. Um, one of the problems and challenges that we found and the inconsistencies was different messages. If a parent is coming in or the patient's coming in through eMERGE, do we allow the parent in? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depended who they spoke to, depended on the, um, the situation. If a child was coming from the floor for surgery, again, another different uh, set of information was being given to the parents and therefore uh, a challenge when they came down to the OR. It, the clearest situation was in daycare surgery, which is the bulk of our surgeries, of course. However, even there, um, there were some issues in that parents um, the final say wasn't being given to the anesthesiologist and the team. The parents were coming over already dressed. So we've, we've gotten together with a great working group and saying how can we smooth out this process so that everyone's getting the same information, getting it and giving the same information. And so here in our new um, handout for the parents, this will be given um, in pre-admission clinic. It will be posted in posters in eMERGE on the floors in our daycare surgery. It will be handed out in packages and it will also be um, on the tables on, in laminated uh, sheets so that everyone's getting the same information. And again, the key was to keep it in everyday language. Um, showing parents that we understand what's, what they're potentially going through and how can we make this work. And, but also saying that sometimes it's not going to work or it's not going to be available. So we wanted to be very clear that the anesthesiologist caring for your child is responsible for making the final decision, and that is said in a couple of places. And please remember just one parent or support person can go with your child into the operating room. So we, it sometimes feels like we're repeating it, but we need to repeat the message. When you come into an environment where you're worried and anxious, you don't necessarily hear it the first time or you don't retain it the first time. So repetition and consistency in the message is absolutely key. Uh, a number of people have touched on the effect of the anesthesia on the child and the parent being concerned about what they see. So what we've got down here is as children and youth become sleepy, some close their eyes, they fall asleep, some enter a stage of excitement, etc. And so we wanted to inform the parents that this is normal, do not be alarmed. In my experience with uh, parental presence, when I'm attending a parent with a volunteer and their child, I stay very, very close to them. And as the child enters the excitement phase, I'll say, now remember, this is normal. And they're, uh, for the most part, they're all great. Yes, I'm fine with this, I'm fine with this. Um, also a reminder, and as Terry said, they're very distracted when they come in. And admittedly, there's the odd parent that comes in, I think, um, just for the experience of coming into the operating room. And so they do tend to look around because maybe they've only seen it on television and to see what's really happening. And some of our rooms are filled with equipment, especially when you get um, navigation systems, microscopes, 
and multiple table setups. It's very intriguing, and there's, there can be quite a few people in the room. So as Terry was saying, very important to prompt them and to remind them to be present with their child and to focus on the child. Without question, I would say probably 95% of the time, parents, uh, once the child is asleep and they're escorted from the room, that's when they break down. They're, they've maintained their cool, they've been on top of things, and now is their time to release. So sometimes our volunteers can have a little bit of a challenge getting them back to the front of the, of, uh, the, the OR and getting them settled again. So that's something we're cognizant of and very in tune to, to support the parent even after they've left the room and the child is off to sleep. Um, so I'm reminding them in the OR, it's sterile, don't touch anything without permission. We also tell them we're very hands-on and we keep our hands on them so that there's no risk of them wandering over to a sterile area in the operating room. Um, what we would like to see, and as we roll this out, is more preparation and child life, our child life here in, at CHEO is really fabulous. But of course, they have their limitations as well in how much time they have. And so by, in some ways, trying to get more preparation in as many avenues as we can, we think would be helpful. We have a virtual tour, we have um, our child life do speak with the families where we're exploring ideas of, you know, can they speak with them in groups, um, with the handouts, is that helpful? And also um, speaking to them uh, on the floors in preparation for surgery and in eMERGE as well. Um, and as I say, communication is, is the single most important factor, consistent communication, and saying it more than once if need be, because not everyone is going to hear the first time. Um, I think that's probably about all I have to say about it, and I don't know if there's any questions at this point. All right. Uh, there, there are quite a few questions. I think we'll move on uh, to our next presenter and finish up the presentations and, the, and then take all of the questions uh, at the end. Um, so our next prevents, pre, pre, I keep saying preventer. Our next <laughs> presenter is uh, Alexandra Christofides from uh, Humber River Hospital in Toronto. So uh, she was. And I apologize for that technical difficulty, but I appreciate your patience and your attention. I am a certified child life specialist. I've been with Humber River for 15 years. I have developed and implemented the child life program here in 1998, including the PPI program, which I had developed and implemented, implemented in collaboration with anesthesia surgeons, nursing admin. In order to implement this program, um, we back peeled everything and began with in-services conducted by CLS separately with each professional group to introduce the PPI program, discuss and organize division of responsibilities and roles of each profession, benefits of PPI, discuss and address issues and concerns, and we did literature reviews. So I did that with anesthesia separate, surgeon separate, nursing separate, clerical support, and then bringing on the child life students. There was a pilot with each anesthetist with at least one child to give feedback and evaluation and from there the program grew and we had many learning curves. All of what I just heard everybody talked about, we had all those learning curves and growing pains over the past 15 years. PPI is for all children 12 to 13 years or younger, um, the way it began, that displayed anxiety pre-op and we had eventually changed it to PPI for all children up to 12 to 13 years. PPI was then extended to the HRH church site in 2002. We also extended it to teens with anxiety, developmental delays, and special needs. Um, currently, any teenager that asks us they would like their parent to come in and be present, we do that for them as well. We have also extended our program to adults with developmental delays and special needs or adults with um, diagnosed anxiety disorders where they will have a family member or a parent or a care worker with them in the operating room for induction. The stats include that we have had over 20,135 parents participate in PPI at HRH over 15 years for children 12 years and under. I did not include the stats for the teens or the adults, it's a lot lower. We have had an average of zero to two parents per year express they were not happy they came in to the operating room for induction, yet they all expressed they were happy they were there to support their child. The remainder expressed they were happy that they came in. 
Um, zero parents passed out in the OR. Zero parents made any aggressive behavior. Zero parents tried to touch anything um, or anything like that. Um, the biggest lessons learned over the years, because it was, I'd say, a good two, three years to um, get it to up to where it is now and ongoing still. Inductions for children 12 years and younger, they do with a mask, a gas inhalation with nitrous evil. IV starts once the child is asleep or induced. Leads go on while or once the child is induced because apparently it's very invasive for the children. They allow the child to put the O2 monitor on themselves or help hold the mask or hug their parent for autonomy, mastery, control, empowerment, and comfort. We allow the parent to assume parenting role in the operating room and staff do not crowd around the child or hover. Our two biggest challenges in implementing this PPI program at Humber River was learning the best prep and teaching for parent for excitement phase of anesthesia to prepare them for that, what to expect, language to use, how to coach, support, and encourage their child, and ensure they leave the room once the child is induced. The other challenge was post-induction support to parents. And the second biggest challenge was learning the best prep and teaching for the child to be in the OR with their parent and to gain a child's assent, cooperation, to get onto the bed, put on the mask for coping and decrease their anxiety to make it a more positive hospital experience for them. I'm just going to talk to assent. With adults, you know, you would never force an adult on an OR bed. You would talk to them, let them know what's happening, get their assent. So there's a way, and this is a very big child life um, avenue of getting a child's assent where you explain to them at their developmentally age appropriate level and it must be hands-on interactive play because children learn through play and that's how they explore their world. They get self-expression, opportunity for practice and they become comfortable and familiar with all the equipment and they get to try the mask on in a playroom in a non-threatening atmosphere first and practice. So it becomes more of a play so it doesn't have to be so traumatic. And then by asking the child, is that okay with you, or giving them the choices, would you like to have an IV to go to sleep, or the mask? And of course, more, most young kids will pick the mask and will say, is that okay with you? Just asking a child that, you're giving them assent, you're giving them back a little bit of control of autonomy, which is completely taken away from them when they are in a hospital setting going into the OR. So we're trying to empower the children, and that, in fact, gains their cooperation, and they will trust as well. Okay, the next slide is, um, these slides I'm talking about are titled HRH PPI History Lessons Learned Challenges and Successes. The role of the child life specialist. The role of the child life specialist is to provide developmentally age appropriate prep and teaching to the child and parent for PPI with a teaching kit, opportunity for practice and play. Just to show the movie or do it in a group is not enough. They need an opportunity to sit and practice and play with the equipment, become comfortable and familiar, clear their misconceptions, know what to expect, and then they're empowered, they feel control back, they've got mastery, um, self-esteem, they've had opportunity for self-expression, and they will cooperate and they'll do a great job and they'll feel good about it, and the parents will too. The Child Life Specialist is also to provide prep and teaching to the parent for PPI, including how to coach the child through the anesthetic, what language to use, how to prepare, what to expect for the excitement phase of anesthesia, guidelines of when to leave the room, expectations of the parent, their role, and safety in the room. So they get all that before they walk in. Another role of Child Life Specialist is orientation of the PACU or PATT tour to the child and parent. So they can become comfortable and familiar with that area as well and also giving the parents expectations and what to expect for the delirium stage of coming out of anesthesia, which goes hand in hand from one room to the other to keep it consistent. Child Life is responsible for getting the scrubs for the parents and directs them where to, pardon me, where to get changed you know, getting the child to help get the parent changed so they feel like they're part of the process. Child Life will escort the child and parent into the OR. Child Life facilitates the PPI. We have what's called the Hug and Hold program or Decide the Position of Comfort. So our position of comfort is be called Hug and Hold. One might be where the, child, the most popular one and the one that anesthesia is most comfortable with is where the child lays on the bed. And if you go back and look at this PowerPoint slide, I've got lots of pictures to show that um, position in each stage of it and the parent does a little hug over them so the parent is right over them um, it reduces separation anxiety it reduces stranger anxiety they feel safe 
also the parent feels safe because they're right over them. Parents get become, be, may become emotional regardless of what side of the door they're on. So if your parent cries on the, in the room, it's okay. We also try to prepare them for that and try to encourage them if they can hold on to their emotions until they leave the room just to give that child, that, the child the extra little bit of strength that they need. Um, so another position that we've often done is where the parent will sit on the OR bed and hold the child in their arms, not hold down, but hold them in a comfort position. And one arm will go underneath where a nurse will hug from the back to hold their arms so the child doesn't pull the mask, and the parent gets to hold the other hand. We also have another one, comfort position, for really young children. Um, or if the child is really has a lot of anxiety or developmental delay, where the parent can sit on the chair and hold their own child in the um, in their lap. And Child Life is responsible with collaboration of anesthesia and nursing. We put the child on the bed while once their um, excitement phase is finished and they're asleep. And we completely prepare the parents for all that and how to do it. Each anesthesiologist has a different preference of position. So from working for, with them, I would never just do something without consulting them. I know their preference. So I wouldn't have a parent sit on a bed for anesthesia that's not comfortable with that position. Same as I wouldn't have a, a parent sit in a chair for anesthesia that not comfortable with that position. So you also need to know what comfort position anesthesia is comfortable with and which ones they prefer. And sometimes I'll come in the room and they will say, you know, let's do this way. But child life, surgeon, and anesthesia always consult before the parent goes in the room. And any concerns always get relayed beforehand. So there's no surprises. Um, child life is also responsible to coach the parent, to coach the child for instance, reminders, uh, whispering to encourage one voice, what to say to the child in case they forget, encouraging the parent to talk slowly, trying not to repeat their words, trying not to repeat the child's name, and just coaching them, telling them they're doing a great job and positive reinforcement. And we also, along with anesthesia, nursing surgeons, and everyone, we support and encourage the child and the parent and give them both positive reinforcement. Another child life role is to escort the parent out of the OR once the child is induced, and anesthesia will give a signal, because sometimes they let them stay a little bit longer and give them a little kiss on the cheek. Um, provide, child life also provides post-induction support to parent and conducts the survey right after. We started with some very long surveys. We've got it down to two questions, which also get documented in our child life documentation screens. The first survey question is, are you glad you came in the operating room for your child? And the second one is, do you think that helped your child that you were there? And we document that in the computer. Um, OR nursing also documents in the computer any special comments or any special positions, the ch comfort position, and which parent has come in the OR. So we do document everything, which we pull a lot of stats from as well, and help evaluate the effectiveness of the program. Another child life role, guide parent to the area to change from scrub scrubs and gown, and additionally escort the parent to the waiting area. The next slide is, again, HRH, PPI, history, lessons learned, challenges, successes, considerations that I'm recommending and that we always consider here. Child life students and interns we use to help with coverage with prep and teaching and all child life roles to stretch. OR coordinator in the, the RN in the OR is also used to help with coverage of PPI in the OR. Say there's a few rooms going at once. If there's a sick call, if, it, if it's really busy. And we have a couple of key nurses that will also help facilitate PPI in the operating room, provide the coaching um, for the parent and escort them out, and usually child life there to bring them back. So if we have quite a few rooms going at once, because we are a small regional pediatric level two hospital, but we have also had three up to four rooms happening at once. So we will also prioritize which child is going with who, and usually, well, always child life will take the child that will be the most challenged. Additionally, child life cross coverage Sorry, child life cross coverage is encouraged in a children's hospital. I did hear one of the presenters mention, and we talk about this at this hospital all the time, we need to prioritize, prioritize our child life coverage. Our number one child life coverage in this hospital is PPI, and covering the other areas are often things that can wait. So we do prioritize. We have a one full-time, a .5, and a 
casual. So between the three of us, we try our best and we try to use as much resource as possible and we're still learning. Um, another consideration is that parents are escorted out of the OR earlier in a rapid sequence induction. So we still bring parents in for emergency cases and that, but if it requires a rapid sequence induction, um, anesthesia will always let child life know first and they won't stay until they're completely anesthetized and anesthesia will always signal to um, child life or let mom or dad know that thank you very much and you know it's time for you to go and thanks for your help. So they're very encouraging. Another consideration that makes a big difference and these are all learning curves that we've had is the use of language. Very important to say bed instead of table, medicine mask instead of gas, sleep instead of going under or knocked out and parents should not go in the OR for PPI without any prep or teaching because that's just going to be a disaster and it's not fair to the parent, the child, the staff. And for all those um, reasons, we do a very thorough and excellent preparation teaching to the child and the parents so they know their expectations, they know what to expect, there's no surprises, there's no fear of the unknown. And I've underlined here that the success of PPI heavily, heavily relies on team collaboration between child life, anesthesia, surgeons, nurses, clerical staff, uh, students, and heavily relies on the prep and teaching for the child and parent and the facilitation in the OR and especially the post-induction support to the parent. Um, I've also included my email here if anyone is interested in PPI or needs some reference. Um, we are more than happy to help here at Humber River Hospital and if there's any child life or anesthesia that would like to come to Humber River Hospital at either of our sites to shadow anesthesia or child life or in a room, you are welcome to do so. And I'm saying that because the director is sitting right here in the room, Bev Phelps. <laughs> And I just had to get her blessing because we already talked about that and we've had many students come through anesthesia for locum and people who just wanted to come to see how it works to try to implement it in their hospital. So you're welcome to do that and we, um, we're really happy about that because we know it really helps. The next slide is benefits. Ooh. Benefits of PPI is promotes family and patient-centered care, improves patient satisfaction, promotes a positive hospital experience for a child and family, eliminates any holding down, pre-sedative drugs, IV starts, trauma, promotes a more positive experience for the entire team, increases a child's cooperation, assent, which again is allowing them to understand what's happening and allowing them to give you permission to do what you need to do, coping, increases self-esteem, autonomy, control, mastery, empowers a parent and a child, promotes normal child development, it reduces all the negative effects of hospitalization on children, reduces separation and stranger anxiety, it promotes the rights of the child in the healthcare system, it's the child way, child-friendly way and you made a child happier. The next slide is a series of pictures showing how we do prep and teaching in the playroom with hands-on interactive developmentally age-appropriate teaching kits with children. There's also a picture additionally of a child and a parent practicing a hug and hold position in the playroom out of scrubs with an anesthetic mask and there's a picture with how anesthesia gets down at their level to prepare them for when they do their assessment. The child sees anesthesia surgeons, OR nurse before we go into the operating room and everyone encourages and supports all the prep and teaching because we're all on board and on the same, um, same, same notes for everything. There's another picture of a mom carrying her own daughter mm. into the operating room, laying her daughter on the bed, doing the special hug and hold. You can see facial expressions and see how the staff stand back and let the parent assume parenting and the actual induction. Yes, and all I was going to say, all the rest of the slides are actually uh, links and inserts from all the pre presentations, poster presentations, conference presentations, um, and I've included the, um, actually, I've also included the document from the United Nations and the rights of the hospitalized child in the healthcare system with all the articles referenced there. Thank you very much interrupting but we do have uh, quite a building list that i've not we have about 20 well, well it's closer to 15 minutes uh, left to take some questions and, and we did want to hand over to frank for just a, a, a conclusion and and uh, some of the recommendations from the report so over to you frank do you have a slide to put up frank yes i do okay it's on there now okay so um 
So this is so this is just take one minute. Essentially, what you've um, what, what 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 this is sort of summing up all that we've heard. Better communication uh, is crucial, especially up front. A lot more transparency um, that will that will reduce the number of unwelcome surprises. The importance of preparation programs is crucial. More openness to what the evidence says and to different kinds of evidence. That includes everyone being open to being a being aware of what the evidence is, and I would also suggest, you know, that we look at uh, broad evidence, especially uh, evidence about the consequences, the downstream consequences of of the entire experience, especially parental presence. We had recommendations for parents. Essentially, you know, we looked at most hospital websites. They all have something about preparing for preparation. Very few of them actually are explicit about the uh, parental presence at induction or in the operating room, the CHEO um, way of, of, uh, of communicating is extremely, uh, is, is, uh, is unusual in its helpfulness and in its uh, prevalence. Uh, it's uh, uh, there, <laughs> excuse me. So obviously we want more, and for parents, obviously find out what's available. Um, we also wanted to make sure that, that that piece that shouldn't be missed about the importance of talking to uh, adolescents, to youth about this this uh, this um, process, and about the, the whole idea of essentially preparing yourself uh, and your child in advance uh, for this pr this process. So I'll leave it at that. I uh, could go into more details, but I know there are lots of questions. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to uh, pop up real quick the uh, the, the report uh, that Frank is referring to that, that the coalition has been working on for many years. And we did have a comment coming in from Jonathan saying a big thanks to all of you for working on this issue so diligently over so many years. And it has been quite a number of years. And that report is up on the website in front of, that's in front of you, the, the ccyhc.org website right at the top. There's a link there so you can you can actually download and read the report. Um, so we're going to get into some of the questions. Uh, and... We had a number of questions that were related to the parent in the in the OR, uh, specifically around uh, how you main is uh, how you maintain a sterile field and what's the role of the volunteer and that sort of thing. And we heard Lorraine and Terry, I think, talking more most specifically about that and the fact that they have the volunteer that's there to keep them from wandering and that sort of thing. But I was wondering if there's any if you could maybe expand a little bit more on the role of that volunteer how, and how you go about sort of managing the parent in the room to make sure they're not uh, uh, getting into the sterile field or, or other issues. Sure, this is Terry and Lorraine. Our volunteers are just super and they um, have had specific education and training on how to uh, manage themselves as their role in the operating room with the parents. We dress, uh, they are dressed, the parents and the volunteer are dressed in cover gowns, hats, masks, uh, and boots. and. The uh, volunteer also reminds them, I will be staying right with you. And, and they do, they stay right beside them and even in some cases put their hands or arms around them. As we escort the parent and child into the operating room, we introduce them to the other staff in the room and we say, stay very close to me, come right over to the bed. Uh, we'll let you know if you're going somewhere you shouldn't. Put your hands on the bed, feel free. We try to make them feel as welcome and as comfortable as possible. The scrub nurse also makes sure that they stay back, of course, and uh, protect their table if need be, because some of our rooms are small, uh, and if we have a great deal of equipment. Um, but we're very, we stay very physically close to our parent and, and the child, of course, and shepherd them in and almost create a protective circle around them. Is that helpful? I think that I think that it was it was it was was great it was a great answer to the question certainly uh, I think you answered about four questions at one shot there so that was excellent uh, the uh, the next question it came in during Dr. Wright's presentation uh, and they were at they're they're essentially asking this person has a special needs child about four years old uh, is having his ninth surgery she has been present a few times in the past uh, and, but she's wondering, however, if surgery is more complicated, would it not be allowed or are there any types of surgery where it might not be a possibility to be present during induction? So maybe we'll start with Dr. Wright. But we did see during Dr. Hall's presentation that it's typically the decision of the, of the anesthesiologist as to whether or not the parent's allowed. So maybe, I, I'm no, I don't know if there's a general rule of thumb based on the type of procedure that you could provide, Dr. Wright, as to whether or not a parent would typically be involved or, or if we should just hand this, this one over to Dr. Hall. 
Yeah, I don't think there's, um, we encourage, um, we have this huddle in the morning to discuss uh, all relevant issues and I think the surgeons um, talk about positioning and uh, any special uh, concerns that they have, but I would say seldom is the surgeon uh, the decision maker other than alerting perhaps the team to uh, parental uh, child um, anxiety or a repeat uh, visit and some experience because the surgeon would have been there in the previous case but not necessarily the anesthetist so uh, but it's largely the decision of the, the anesthesiologist and the anesthesia team. And Dr. Hall do you have any sort of guidelines as to what types of procedures or if you know, that, that would prevent having the parent there? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, I think this is an evolving thing. Um, it, it it doesn't necessarily connect with the kind of operation that's going on. It may. It's probably more important to us from the anesthesia perspective as to what is the underlying state of the child. So kids who are not medically stable, who present, for example, if we have a child who we know has an extremely difficult airway and may have issues maintaining their airway when they're, when they're going under the anesthetic, that may be a situation where we say to the parents, this is really high risk. It's a really high risk setting and we won't have you in for it. But we can have medically complex kids who are stable and we do bring parents into the room. Um, sort of traditionally, people haven't in our institutions allowed parents to come in when a child is having cardiac surgery. Um, and, you know, there, there may be, you know, that again, that's an evolving thing. There may be kids coming for cardiac procedures where it may not be such a big deal whether the parents are in or not. There may be kids who are obviously, you know, cyanotic, unstable, where in fact it's not a good idea to have the parents present. So I would say it probably has more to do with the underlying state of the child, their, their medical stability, whether they have particular issues that may present big challenges at the time of induction and such that we have to stay very, very focused on, on the child. And I think that would be more the factor um, than the actual procedure that's going to follow. Um, this next question is for our CHEO colleagues in general. Uh, someone, uh, actually one of you, maybe one of your colleagues at the University of Ottawa, from the looks of her email address, is asking, has there been any research done uh, at CHEO since the, the PPI implementation? And if so, w w were there any sort of general findings? Not from the anesthesia perspective. We haven't put any data out uh, about... Um, about our PPI experience here, and I, get, I would let Lorraine and and address what's come out from maybe the nursing side. Unfortunately, we don't have a child life representative at our institution that's here today, so uh, that would be another group of people that would be good to talk to. We haven't done uh, any formal um, study or review. We are going by experiential um, outcomes, really, and um, that it's what we're seeing is it's flowing um, better uh, as we in, improve our communication with our families um, and better involve our child life specialists and volunteers. The process itself is much smoother and there's less um, anxiety or disruption at the front. So it's, it just seems to be flowing uh, a little bit better. And again, it's all about that consistent communication. All right, thank you. Uh, similar question for Alexandra at Humber River. Uh, they're asking, uh, has the PPI program been evaluated in terms of patient and organizational outcomes since it's been uh, since its implementation? Hi. Yes, it has. For every child that goes in the room, there is an evaluation and a survey for the child and the parent, and. On the attachments that I've sent, it actually has all the stats from the first one that we did in 2005. Um, and let me just refer back to the stat on this PowerPoint. So over the over the 15 years, just for children 12 and under, we've had 20,135 parents come through for PPI. Zero to two parents per year have expressed that they were not happy they came into the room, yet happy they were there to support their child. 
And we also have uh, we also have stats in our documentation to show that the PPI does help the child cope better, the parent cope better, and they're more cooperative. We've never had a child run out of the room or had to hold anyone down or give pre-sedative drugs. But if that person is specifically interested too, they can email me and we can send out some more information to them. All right, sounds on good. What specifically they're looking for. All right, and as as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, we will be putting uh, Alexandra's presentation up on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network on the page that's now in front of you on the screen. Um, the the person yeah. asking that qu initial question there went on to ask, uh, is the PPR program at Humber River, I am assuming that means parental presence during recovery. Is that linked to the PPI program? And if so, how? what does the PPR program look like? Alexandra? Can I, can I mention, Doug, just as in terms of parental presence at, at recovery, uh, there's, a, re, there's a, a, a study done out of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where the parental presence at recovery went from 44% to 90% over the course of four years. And it was really a, a, a matter of you know, doing specific things and changing the disposition to, to realizing, first of all, this can be helpful, this can be useful, etc. So certainly, I mean that that study, which again is uh, is on the list of references of the report, uh, would be terrific for anyone. And I also would note that the the, the work that was done out of Alberta Children's Hospital, uh, a point that uh, I think Dr. Hall made, and that is, you know, parental presence and recovery did not reduce the amount of crying a child did, and it's not necessarily a bad thing if a child cries in recovery. So if you're just looking at the amount of crying that goes on in recovery, it may not make a difference. But that same study showed it made a significant difference in children's behavior weeks po uh, after discharge. Uh, this is Terry from CHEO. Um, I know that we started our parental pre presence in recovery before we started our PPI program. So um, that we've had that implemented since the early 2000s. and. Um, it, it is a strong program and it's been felt here within our institution that it's, it's been very beneficial. It's Alexandra from Humber River Hospital, the Certified Child Life Specialist. Um, we also have parental presence in the recovery room and I need to echo that as well. We do prepare the parents for that. There is a crazy delirium stage of coming out of anesthesia. We prepare the parents, but we do not measure success of that with how the children are crying or not because that's just a natural stage of coming out of anesthesia, but they are receiving comfort, support, and encouragement from the parents, and that's how we measure the success of that program. Thank you. Uh, there were a couple questions around the age of, uh, the, the, sort of the age range for when a, ch a parent is allowed to join the child. Um, it's, we noticed, uh, the, this person's asking, and I also noticed that Chio states that it's for greater than one year. Alexandra made it, uh, mentioned uh, services, uh, services for children under 12. I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, but is there a reasoning for the age limits? Alexandra, we'll start with you. Okay, yes. Um, we don't actually really have an age limit. What we did at the beginning was uh, trying to assess the children that were displaying anxiety. And through that, we were learning that it's not fair to just provide PPI for children who are displaying anxiety because some children withdraw and hold emotions in. It doesn't mean they're not feeling the same fear. So we have opened up the program. Um, it actually took maybe three months from November 98th, within three months, we opened it to all children, birth to 12, 13 years old. Absolutely have, um, we offer the program. We don't ask them, we just do it, but we do ask out of getting assent from the child if they want their parent to come or not. They always say yes. Another way to give them back control. In regards to teenagers, it's a tricky age between 12 and 13 because a 12 year old could still be in their third stage of development according to Piaget and Erickson. So you could still be talking to a 12, 13 year old as you would be social emotionally at a seven year old. So we ask the 13 and up if they want their parent to come in or not. 
not, we respect their decision. If we can see they're showing anxiety, we do prepare the parent anyways, because sometimes last minute they change their mind. So because the program runs so well here and our success is so well from what we measure successful, gaining assent, cooperation, and coping from the child and parent, if um, there's a seven-year-old that shows anxiety and wants their parent, we will bring them in. What we don't do is if the child is coping well and showing mastery and independence and says, you know, I could do this, and we assess that they're fine and they'll be okay, but the parent is pushing to come in, we will always respect the child's choice because we find that those are the parents that want to come in just because they want to be there. And if we do that, we're actually then taking away control and autonomy and mastery and independence from that teen. We are there to promote all those things and not take it away from the kids. And we take the parents aside and explain that to them. Additionally, we do it for adults with developmental delays and teens with developmental delays. So we've already crossed that learning curve um, to bring it up to this point to answer your question. All right. Um, we are pretty much out of time, and I did want to leave uh, some time for, for Sarah to do some final comments and, and maybe Elaine Orbein as well. Uh, but we'll, So we'll take maybe this one last question. There are a couple that we will, we will unfortunately have to leave unanswered, but we'll take this one last question. And this person is asking, uh, at an institution where PPI is not currently used with regularity, where would you suggest they begin in implementing or initiation, initiating the conversation with medical staff? Does anyone want to jump in on that one first? If nobody wants to um, respond, it's Alexandra again. I'll say something really quick. I think the first step is to sit with admin and discuss um, all the possibilities, uh, considerations, and then go right to anesthesia and surgeons and discuss the opportunities, the benefits, and have a formal discussion, some lit review, what are the benefits. Each institution has different considerations, and then from there, set up meeting times on how to address all the concerns, what prep you're going to use, because you can't just bring a parent in like that. There's a lot of um, development and planning and in services just to get the program in its work first, I would suggest. Yeah, I, I can comment. I think. Geo, uh, yeah. in, in my experience with doing this type of new programs when they're new, um, similar to a surgical liaison nurse speaking with families during surgeries, is to get a, a team that supports it. So if an anesthesiology champion, a surgeon champion, and and start it on start it on a positive and others will will soon come into it again as Alexander was saying including the research and the evidence and the uh, positive outcomes and speaking with parents family forum youth forum etc and, and I, would say I, would, that, I would argue that uh, the most important group is anesthesia. If you don't have anesthesia on board, uh, you're probably not going to be successful. So all of the comments made about the multiple stakeholders are true, but if your department of anesthesia is not on board, you're probably not going to be successful. Very true, very true. And I, think, and I would say if, you, if, if it's presented as a kind of uh, PR exercise or it's about patient family satisfaction, um, it's better to look at it as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an attempt to... Uh, an effort to improve outcomes, improve care, improve quality. Um, th this goes much beyond uh, a, 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 any kind of PR exercise. All right. <clears throat> and with that, I think we will wrap this up. But I'm going to hand it over to Sarah and Elaine for, uh, for a closing comment. All righty. Hi, everyone. Um, Doug, I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of Sarah, who had to actually go to the OR a few minutes ago. Um, I just want to, on behalf of the coalition, and CAFC is a, is a long-standing member of the coalition, I want to thank, uh, Frank and, uh, and Dr. Jones, of course, uh, Jim Wright, uh, Leslie Hall, Lorraine McInnes, Terry, uh, Pridham, and, uh, Alexandra, uh, Christophides. What an amazing presentation, and, uh, I, you can just tell from the questions that we have engaged and enlightened many colleagues across the country. Um, I think, you know, I, I, not for a second will I attempt to repeat the key messages, but I think when we go back to the Knowledge Exchange Network and view the presentations today, all of the presentations, all of our speakers emphasize 
some very consistent um, and and sort of similar key messages, but there's some very unique messages in each of the presentations that I think are all highly relevant. To Jim uh, Jim's last point about you know the anesthetist must be on board, I think there's strong consensus. But for me, one of the strong messages in addition that came across is truly the interprofessional team effort that the success of um, um, PPI and PPR uh, is really very dependent on. Um, I think in terms of CAFC um, and the coalition uh, supporting the continuation of this knowledge translation and working toward the consistencies across consistency of practice across the country, that's certainly something that we are very committed to and perhaps can sort of use as a, a focus as next steps. So I'm just going to wrap up and, and uh, thank everyone for their leadership, their participation and to all of our participants on today's webinar, thank you for your wonderful engagement. Doug, as always, your leadership is most appreciated. Well, thank you, Elaine, and 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 my thanks as well to the full to the whole panel. I can't believe we finished something close to uh, on time with this many presenters, but we managed to. So I appreciate you all uh, managing to squeeze all of these passionate discussions into uh, such a small amount of time. Uh, so that, as I did mention at the top, this will be, this has been recorded and will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network. It usually takes a couple days for it to get up there. We typically do these webinars on Wednesdays at 11 Eastern time. You can always go to CAFC.org, our main website, uh, under the CAFC Presents section if you're looking for more information about any upcoming webinars. And we hope to see you on the next one. So thanks again to everyone and uh, and goodbye. <laughs>